Great. Well, hello everyone. I'm so grateful to share some of our DPS work as part of a larger study on juvenile steelhead use of Scott Creek, which is a small seasonally closed estuary pictured here. And the data I'll be presenting today is currently in an internal review at the Southwest Fishery Science Center here in Santa Cruz. And my co-authors and I plan to be submitting to limnology and oceanography by year's end. So today I'm gonna to be talking about barbell estuaries, which become intermittently disconnected from the river, their river mouths and are influenced by both tidal and river dynamics. I'll start by introducing our study site, review some of our sandbar open closure dynamics, uh, highlight the DTS results while we're all here, and then conclude with how DTS helped capture these dynamic conditions. So recently, Clark and O'Connor classified nearly half of California's coastal river mouths are influenced by seasonal sandbar formation to varied degrees. Our study site was Scott Creek, which is in Santa Cruz County, a small coastal, a small coastal watershed about 90 kilometers south of San Francisco, which is the red circle in the left figure. Scott Creek is an intensively studied watershed and has a life cycle monitoring station for coho salmon and steelhead trout, which are both ESA listed species. The creek flows through mixed conifer forests and terminates in a small estuary, which is the red arrow in the right figure, which is estimated to be about 5% of the available salmonid habitat. So over a decade of research has been done in the Scott Creek estuary, and it's been characterized as a high risk, high reward habitat. High risk because of elevated predation risks, such as avian predators, and periods of poor water quality included elevated temperature and low DO concentrations. It's also characterized as high reward because it enhances juvenile growth, which increases ocean survival, and they're more likely to return to spawn as adults. So most of what we know comes from studies in the lower estuary, kind of pictured on the map to the left, which is this wide open habitat where we have one water quality sand to kind of characterize this really large habitat. And these previous studies will contrast these conditions with riverine habitat about a kilometer upstream, which is a confined channel with thick riparian vegetation. And so after our, our team's last paper, it became clear that we didn't really know what was happening in the riverine estuary transition zone. And so we were interested at looking at both water quality and how fish use this zone. So this is where DTS came in. So we installed 1.6 kilometers of cable and an XT DTS to continually characterize the thermal regime of the estuary lagoon and the lower main stem creek. The instrument was installed at the upstream end and cable, the cable was laid out and anchored with rocks and sandbags on the channel bottom. And there was a supply at the downstream end with the thanks of sea temps. So we were able to get measurements down and back the length of the cable. The DTS was configured to collect temperature at 25 centimeter increments every 10 minutes on two channels. So we also collected monthly vertical profiles within the estuary to characterize temperature, salinity, and DO within the water column. Here are my coworker Alex and I are on a kayak using a YSI and we designated 31 transects within the lagoon and we took measurements at every 10 centimeters uh, along from the channel bottom to the water surface. And this really allowed us to get kind of the three-dimensional uh, what's happening in depth in addition to the DTS giving us that longitudinal perspective. So conditions within the estuary are dictated by the influx of fresh and salt water and the formation of a sandbar at the creek mouth. So here I'm showing two photos of, of Scott Creek. The top photo is from 2002 showing the estuary connected to the ocean with the mouth point to the south, which is to the right of the photo. And the bottom photo is from 2009, and it shows the lagoon completely disconnected from the Pacific Ocean. And as you can see between these two photos, the mouth oscillates between the north and the south, and this in turn dictates the shape and residual pool volume of the seasonal lagoon, and this directly impacts juvenile rearing habitat. So before jumping into the DTS results, I wanna quickly review the sandbar formation and destruction cycle between the creek and the Pacific Ocean. And the next few slides were adapted for Fronman of 2017. So during the end of the wet season, which is typically May or June in Central California, the estuary can have both saltwater inputs from the ocean and freshwater inputs from the upstream river. 
As the dry season begins, the sandbar formation occurs when there's re reduced fluvial discharge coincides with increased ocean swell and longshore stand deposition. Fresh water is then impounded behind the sandbar and the estuary converts to a seasonal lagoon. And the timing duration of mouth closure is highly variable from year to year and lagoonal conditions can persist for weeks to months. While freshwater is impounded behind the sandbar, the, the lagoon isn't necessarily completely freshwater. In fact, episodic wave overwash events during the summer's high tide can bring salt water, which can rapidly change the water quality in the lagoon. And this is why it's so important for juvenile steelhead. So this trapped salt water between, it will then seep out of the sandbar, which can take a few weeks before lagoon conditions become completely fresh. So with the onset of winter rains, which is typically November or December in normal water years, which we're not currently having in Central California, uh, the sandbar will erode by elevated stream flow or high energy waves, and the connectivity with the marine environment is reestablished. So we installed the DTS cable in June of 2018 before the sandbar formation, and we measured up until 10 days before the sandbar broke at the end of November. And while it would have been really great to measure the sandbar breaching event, we also wanted to protect the equipment, so we pulled it out just before this catastrophic event when a lot of discharge goes out to the ocean. So now for the DTS results, over the course of the five-month study, the, D the DTS collected over 276 million points. So this is a huge data set, and today I'm going to be showing almost a million data points, which is showing average daily temperatures. To do this, I'll be revealing the time series over four distinct phases. And just to get you oriented, the DTS output is river kilometer on the y-axis. So flow is from up in the river and habitat to down into the estuary and lagoon. And time is on the y-axis. Temperature is symbolized with color, with cooler colors representing the typical growth zone for juvenile steelhead and warmer colors corresponding to stressful and potentially lethal temperatures. So in, in phase zero, it shows a tidally influenced estuary, and I'm dividing the two habitats, rivering uh, at the top of the figure versus the estuary slash lagoon on the bottom of the figure with a white dashed line. And this white line will be throughout the phases just to give you kind of the, the difference between the two habitats. And overall, there were cool homogeneous conditions between the two of them. And there was some warm water in the lower estuary which is brought in with high tides from the Pacific Ocean. And what became clear with our water quality monitoring was that salt water was warmer than fresh water. So we were able to use this to track water quality with, within the study segment. So in phase one, the sandbar formed blocking the estuary from the ocean. It transitioned to a seasonal lagoon inundating an additional 100 meters of upstream habitat, which is what that shift in the white line is. The maximum extent of lagoon inundation didn't vary after this, so you'll just see the white line throughout the phases. And the pink temperatures at the bottom of the figure indicate some salt water, which was trapped in the lagoon after sandbar formation. In phase two, we observed two wave overwash events, which added considerable salt water to the lagoon. This resulted in vertical stratification, where the bottom water became disconnected from the atmosphere and acted as a heat reservoir. The lagoon became warmer than 26 degrees for 10 days, which is really hot for salmonids. At its most extreme, we observed temperatures as high as 30 degrees in the lower quarter kilometer in August, suggesting really challenging conditions at the bottom of the lagoon. One minute, Rosalia. Thank you. By contrast, the river and habitat um, was more than four degrees cooler than the lagoon, and the DTS revealed a thermal gradient between the two habitats, which has been hypothesized as a major driver of behavioral thermoregulation. In phase three, we saw cool river and inflows push out hot water out of the lagoon, and the long warm bands that you see, you can think of as areas of depths where there was actually isolated pockets of hot water corresponding to dips in bathymetry. And in phase four, we saw a marked cooling within the study segment, which was driven by vertical mixing, cooler air temperatures, and shorter photo period. And it's important to note that we caught juvenile steelhead in the lagoon during the entire study. So we saw the sandbar form, rapid heating from some wave overwash events, and then cooling eventually in the autumn. So thankfully, DTS wasn't the whole story. And here I'm showing five monthly vertical profiles. And just for time, I would like to just show that 
uh, while there was vertical stratification in August, there was cool water at the surface the entire study. So fish were able to access this and then move uh, upstream. So DTS's fine grain detail helped us capture dynamic conditions. And these wave overwash events are something really unique that DTS was able to highlight that we hadn't really studied in the past. And hopefully, uh, this research will help inform some upcoming restoration efforts, including the removal of the bridge I'm showing here, the California Highway 1 Bridge. Okay.